Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm Sarah Leonard, Editor-in-Chief of Lux Magazine. We're here today to discuss a strategy for reproductive freedom from the left. Um, and we have quite an amazing group of panelists who I'm extremely excited to talk with. Um, I'll say a few words first, introduce everybody. Um, we'll have about an hour to talk and about half an hour for questions. Um, thank you for bearing with us as we started a tiny bit late. Um, so when I think about the challenges that the sort of broader pro-choice movement faces, I often think about a particular episode um, during the nomination hearings for Brett Kavanaugh, which feels like 1,000 years ago now. Um, and a major pro-choice organization here in New York, where I am, uh, had a big rally, which I attended. Everyone who attended was furious um, that a credibly accused rapist might end up on the court. Everyone was itching to do something. Um, and the other national news at the time happened to be that uh, so-called Maverick Senator John McCain had just died. So speaker after speaker for this organization got up on the dais and began by paying tribute to John McCain, a politician who was anti-choice. And then it was, when it was time to urge people to action, there were really only two, call your senator or make a donation. That was basically it. And this episode captured everything that felt wrong in that moment with the most visible part of the pro-choice movement, a sort of loyalty to establishment politicians who might or might not protect the court, a fundraising apparatus that outstripped any grassroots organizing, a preference for properly permitted rallies over disruption, a nonprofit advocacy model that said more or less, give us your money and leave the fight to us. And one of the things that made clear that was made clear by the leaked Supreme Court opinion draft was that this strategy obviously has not worked. I went to a local rally after it came down, or you know, the draft sort of came down, and people were angrier maybe even than they were during Kavanaugh, but the rally was basically the same. And it made me feel um, bad. Um, yet all along, people have been organizing in a lot of other ways developing abortion funds, legal strategies, and direct action plans that are geared towards organizing and supporting people to fight on their own behalf. And it seems clear that masses of people are ready to fight. So while abortion has long been inaccessible for many women due to cost, access, cumbersome laws, more privileged women are now also under threat and they're looking for answers too. And this conversation today is an attempt to see what the movement ahead might look like when Roe is overturned, um, and when there's no illusion that anyone is going to save us but ourselves. And I should note two things. Um, first, Lux Magazine has just released an ebook with Verso Books about today's abortion fight. It's meant to be useful. It has contributions from all over the country, and in fact, the world, and it's free. You can download it now using the link in the chat. Um, and second, Lux Magazine, since its founding, has been writing about the issues we're raising tonight for the whole one year of its existence. Um, and we'll share some of that work in the chat. You can also subscribe on our website to get the current issue, um, which I have to say is like pretty great. Um, and the money that comes in for subscriptions goes directly to support the feminist writers and reporters who we publish. Um, so I'll introduce the panelists quickly. You can also learn more about them on our Eventbrite site and what, what's being posted in the chat. Um, I think we've cited every one of these organizations in our magazine. They're spectacular. We're thrilled to convene this. Um, we regret that Monica Ray Simpson from Sister Song can't be with us, um, but uh, we have Amir Jones with us instead, which we appreciate, um, and also Ann Roomberger from NYC for Abortion Rights. Um, so quick introductions. Um, so Lori Bertram Roberts is co-founder of the Mississippi Reproductive Freedom Fund and executive director for the Yellowhammer Fund in Alabama, a reproductive justice organization. Rocky Gonzalez is founder and board chair of the Frontera Fund in Texas, deputy director of the Austin Justice Coalition, and an undoing racism trainer with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. Uh, Farah Diaz Teo is senior counsel and legal director for If, When, How, and has previously held a position as a senior staff attorney at National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Um, I'm grabbing Amir's bio since he just joined us. Um, 
Amir's entrance to reproductive justice was at Spark, Reproductive Justice Now. Um, volunteering at Spark helped him see connections between bodily autonomy and his role in allyship to female-bodied people and trans feminine folks. And he especially appreciates being at Sister Song, where he can bring his whole authentic self to work. Um, Anne Roomberger is an activist with NYC for Abortion Rights and NYC Democratic Socialists of America, as well as the U.S. Marketing Director at Verso Books, where she helped produce the abortion ebook in collaboration with Lex. So, thank you um, for bearing with me through the uh, my my introduction here, and let's launch right into it. Um, so, I'd actually like to start with Lori. Um, one of the things that's characterized your work at the Mississippi Freedom Fund and now at Yellowhammer is avoiding what you've referred to as the traditional nonprofit model and the sort of paternalism that can be part of that model. And so I wondered if you could tell us specifically what makes Mississippi Freedom Fund and Yellowhammer different in the way that they operate from the traditional nonprofit model. Yeah, so from the way that we, uh, let me speak about MRFF first, because MRFF and YHF move in two different ways, even though we're similar and we have very similar models. Um, MRFF, or as we lovingly call it, MRF, um, <laughs> is, is still all volunteer, right? So um, while we do give our, our volunteers material support as much as we can, food, uh, whatever, um, they are not paid staff. And, but the thing about MRF is that from its founding, it has always been um, centered on the people who we serve, right? Everyone who is a volunteer, who is a key volunteer in leadership are low income working class people of color and queer. Um, that's always been, it's gonna be until they put me in my grave. Uh, it's written into the bylaws, it's, it, it is what it is. It's going to be what it is. And it's required that there's a youth advisory committee, right? Like it's always been for us, by us, because I personally think that activism should be FUBU style, right? Like that's what I always say. It should be FUBU style for us, by us all the time. So YHF is set up very similarly, except for that it was set up a little bit more like a, a classic nonprofit. But some of the differences are, especially on the staff side, is that Obviously, we pay fair wages. <laughs> everyone has health care. Um, <laughs> everyone, uh, like I don't pay, I don't get paid three times more than you know, like the lowest paid staff member, all that kind of stuff. But the things that are the same about these two organizations is that our focus is not solely on abortion. Yes, we both fund abortion, and we are proud and loud about the fact that we say abortion, we fund abortion, we're unapologetic about it. But we feel like showing up in community, especially in our own communities, and with only abortion funding is eugenic in its own, in, in the way it moves, right? When you only show up in community and say, all we're here to support is you not having children. We're only going to show up to talk to you about birth control and contraception and abortion. But we're not showing up to tell you how you can safely get pregnant, how you can do, you know, um fertility treatments at home right like how you can increase your odds and getting pregnant we're not going to support you when you need to parent your children we're not going to work on right to parent issues we're not going to work on birth you know birth justice issues that is inherently whether intentionally or not a eugenic model that was created not by us frankly by white people who were only only interested in seeing that not necessarily maliciously all the time, but that we made sure that you know certain communities had the option not to have children, but not ever worrying about whether or not we could parent our own children. And we're not here for that. That's Thank you so much. And so I want to go from there um, next to you, Rocky. You run an abortion fund serving the Rio Grande Valley. And so you're right on the front lines of some of the most sadistic new abortion restrictions. Texas also has a trigger law, meaning after Roe is overturned, abortion will be effectively banned in Texas. And so I wanted to ask you, with these ever tightening restrictions, what do you see as the evolving role of abortion funds? 
do they essentially become travel agencies, getting people to less restrictive states? Are they supporting other forms of women's health care, as Lori was describing, or something else? What What is that, in your mind, going to look like? Yes, so I preface this by saying those are the exact questions that we have been asking ourselves um, for some time. It is an existential crisis moment for abortion funds, um, in, abortion funds in particular, um, and especially those of us, like, you know, Lori saying that, like, we don't just fund abortion. There's a lot of things that we do. There's a lot of work that we support. Um, and because our primary directive is making sure that people get the abortions that they need, once that becomes illegal, we have to figure out what to do, right? So it's it's a very sensitive and um, difficult um, thing to just talk about. So I'm like going to try to not cry at you here because it's been, you know, it's been it's been difficult. I will not lie. Um, I think that, you know, I'd like to speak from my, like my personal um, perspective at this point in time. Um, the way that we are able to maneuver those questions really is a mix of like constantly talking to the lawyers. We have teams of lawyers, you know, um, in, you know, you know, litigators and, you know, civil, you know, criminal defense attorneys and all just all kinds of legal expertise. And, you know, people, reporters, um, panel presenters, like people come to us all the time and they're like, what is like, can you help us understand this legal like situation? And we're like, yo, like we're trying to do the same over here. And there is not one set of like lawyer, power lawyer team that can actually answer those questions for us easily. And so it becomes hard to, you know, answer those questions for folks who are really eager to find out like what is actually going on because there's so much gray area and people are in disbelief because it feels so fascist and it feels so unremarkably believable that they assume that there's some answer that can like clear up this mess. And the reality is that there isn't right. Like they, they, we are in unprecedented water here at this moment in time. And so we are getting creative. We are shoring our people up. We're making sure that those of us who have staff know that like, we're going to take care of them no matter what happens. Um, we are working on what does it look like for us to pivot, um, you know, because like Lori is saying, it's not just about funding abortion, right? Like it's not just paying the abortion, you know, there's so much more to what we do. And so for me, I've been telling people like, no, like abortion funds aren't going to go anywhere. We might like alter our mission statements, but we are here. Like we are not going anywhere. We're here to continue the work and there's so much work to do right so um some years ago you know the the landscape of um abortion rights really was like abortion rights like nonprofit. i will say really was led by white women right like we were not using trans inclusive language we were not like talking about like the racism of the approach of the pro-choice you know movement um, we were not talking about access you know all, all of these things and so our our network has this really amazing and fresh ability to take something that is uh, frankly just fucked up and you know wash it clean and 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 rebuild it because that's what we do. We're builders. Our network is resourceful um, and we are you know very like we love each other. Like I don't think that in any other movement that I've ever been a part of that like the people love each other the way that you know abortion advocates and funders do. You know we're tight in a way we have these experiences you know that really connect us and so for me personally speaking i don't think it's necessarily a simple question of like oh abortion funding is going to be illegal so now what are y'all going to do it's like more okay the strategies that we've been talking about for the last five years i mean we've been telling y'all you know cross movement folks you know don't haven't traditionally picked up the abortion flag because our issue is divisive or whatever and they don't want to you know, uh, alienate their members. So you don't, you know, historically, we didn't have labor folks and enviro folks and other folks showing up and saying abortion is our issue also. Um, but so now everyone's coming to the table and we're like, okay, great. All that has to happen now is you got to stay, right? Just stay with us because for the past, I want to say, I don't know, Lori, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but like five years or so, we've been in meetings that are all titled, you know, post row strategy, post row scenario, post row, you know, whatever. And we've been telling people and then we get treated like we're wild extremists because we're like it's it's coming it's happening and 
you know, it's 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 really difficult to be in this situation now where it's like actually happening. And people are like, oh shit, y'all were like not just like being extra, right? Like, no, we, we we've been talking about this, we've been planning this, we have we're prepared, right? Like, if nothing else, we are we're prepared. We're prepared to make the pivot, and we're prepared to do the groundwork necessary to keep our people from being criminalized. We're prepared to do the groundwork necessary to make sure that people have resources to feed their families. We're prepared to do the legislative advocacy work required to f do the harm reduction. This is like how I see legislative advocacy policy work is harm reduction, right? Um, we're prepared to do that, to do all of the harm reduction that we can, and we are prepared to be on the front lines. We have droves of our people who are willing to put their bodies on the line who are willing to get arrested become political prisoners like we will we will get louder and we will get stronger and we will um implement the strategies and the like creative approaches that we've been talking about for the last five years so one of the things maybe i can ask you and laurie about together before moving on um to our other panelists is one of the advantages you're describing of abortion funds is the ones that you guys have um, have worked organizing are extremely connected with grassroots activists and people who actually are in the community and care what happens and also know what's going on. Um, and so I guess sort of my question to you guys is, as you know, abortion is banned, are there, do you see abortion funds becoming sort of like hubs of political activity in a different way? You know, taking different kinds of action, sort of like drawing on that connection. Because the I mean, the National Network of Abortion Funds, it comprises many organizations with deep connections all over the country. I mean, that's incredibly powerful. And so I wonder how you sort of see that coming to life in different ways in response to this moment. So if, if y'all don't mind, I, I don't mean to go first. <laughs> uh, first, I want to respond to something Rocky said about the last five years. I don't know if Rocky remembers, but when Trump got elected, we literally had an oh shit, Trump got elected meeting <laughs> on the West Coast. You know what I'm talking about in Oakland. It was like almost most of the funds had at least one, one representative there and, and plotting out what are we doing? What is the course? What if Roe falls? What? What are y'all's big imaginations? Out of that meeting is when I re told people I was gonna buy the fun shack in Mississippi. And I thought I was like out of my mind for having that idea and everybody was like, no, no, do it, do it. So like some of the most radical ideas that are not so radical now came out of these like I, these idea sessions that we had five and six years ago. And I can tell you part of the pro planning that MRFF and Yellowhammer are gonna be implementing now are things that we started doing in 2013. Yeah. We started training people on how to safely use mesoprostol in 2013 and 14 in Mississippi. We've been working on each one teach one since 2013. So like that's been a thing that's been going on. Now to the other thing about our networks. So at YHF, we have an organization that we work with and who um, their founders on our staff, Margins, Black Women, Women for Black Women, right? Uh, Janice organizes in Birmingham, mostly around, you know, basic needs for um, Black single moms. She has a network in almost every neighborhood in Birmingham where there are low income Black women in need. She's got five pantries across the city. She's always doing pop-ups, giving things away in the projects. She's everywhere. Um, because for one, she did this deal with Amazon to get all their returns. So she has all this laundry soap, all this dish soap, all these things to give away electronics, everything. She's been doing Christmas giveaways for five years, backpack giveaways. And this day, today, I'm saying all of this because today in our Slack, Janice said, you know, I've been working hard to make sure I'm giving out the accurate information about our post row planning and about Mesoprostol. And I said, she said, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm being valuable to the team. And I said, Janice, your organizing for all of the time you have been an organizer is the value to the team. The fact that when we need to put out all of this information to safely go into the communities, that the networks that you have built up over the years that had nothing to do with abortion, that we can then go into the communities and put out this information to all these wide connections that you have made 
is the value, right? The fact that we have connections and have done support with breastfeeding groups, with trans groups, with groups that are working with homeless communities, with domestic violence communities, right? Like that we've done work with the, the plan A group in the Mississippi Delta. Like those things weren't done to be strategic, but they can be used in strategic ways in partnerships because they need us now just as much as we need that outreach, you know, that ability to do outreach easier than us building it from the ground up to those same communities. Why would we reinvent the wheel and why should they? Yeah, I was just feeling in congregation right there for a minute. Thank you, Lori. And I totally just based on what your question was, because I was just into that. That's okay. I mean, we, we can keep it moving if it felt like that was the response that also okay. spoke to you. But I was sort of asking about how abortion funds as deeply connected organizations within their communities might become centers of um, a new kind of political activity. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, again, Lori was taking us to church, but um, it's not it's not new. Um, it's just that the spotlight is on us now. We've always been that way. Um, some of us, you know, more or, or less than others, depending on, you know, how long folks have, you know, had the uh, queer trans BIPOC leadership that was needed to take it there. Um, but it's, it's not a new thing. That's what we have been doing. And that's what we're going to keep on doing. And I think the distinction now is that funders and the general mainstream public that doesn't usually pay attention is now paying attention like what are y'all gonna do like y'all we we've been doing it just you know we um i think we know what to do um and you know we're used to dealing with cycles of support um in texas in particular we have session every two years um and so every time we have a session in texas abortion stuff gets thrown at the wall and, you know, everyone comes to, you know, support us and get really loud about abortion for like a month or two after session, and then they go away. And then a year and a half later, we do another session and then it happens again. So, we're, you know, we've always been in this sort of like lots of support and then it dies down once the new cycle is over and lots of support and once it dies down, but that has never stopped us from doing what we do. Um, I think it's just more visible now and that's great for us and for our communities. Great. And I do want to also return later to this question of um, the the sort of growing education of, of self manage around self-managed abortions and that sort of thing, which I think is probably important to talk about today. Um, I wanted to turn to you, Farah, I believe also a Texan. Um, and uh, your organization, If When How, defends women who are being threatened with legal action because of pregnancy outcomes. Um, among other things. And as having a uterus becomes a growing legal liability, even more so than it already was, it seems that the reproductive justice movement has, um, you know, the a growing, I mean, it was already, it was already part of the analysis, it was already there, but a more and more visible maybe overlap with the movement against mass incarceration and for abolition. For example, prosecutors, which have long been a target of that movement, are going to be extremely powerful in determining who actually goes to court for violating abortion restrictions. Um, and so you can imagine overlapping efforts to get rid of tough on crime prosecutors that have multiple angles. Um, I know your organization was also recently involved in setting up a bail fund. Um, and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the overlap you see between these movements um, and how that affects our strategy going forward. Yeah, thanks for the question. I'm glad that you kind of started and then sort of walked back a little because I think the first thing I was going to say is that like actually this isn't a new intersection. If we're talking about the reproductive justice perspective, which, you know, I feel lucky to be an inheritor of in the work that I do. Lawyering is not a reproductive justice strategy exactly, but I consider the work that I'm doing lawyering in service of reproductive justice of its ends and of the people that that framework seeks to serve who are exactly the people that our society marginalizes. And part of that marginalization is criminalization, right? Like just certain folks, black, indigenous, other people of color, queer folks, 
immigrants, these people are targeted in every way by our society, whether that's for substandard medical care, whether that is for, you know, mistreatment and obstetric violence when they're giving birth, including in that criminalization and punishment, you know, that they may face on the basis of their pregnancy, giving birth, having an abortion, any of the reproductive decisions they make, right, the criminalization of parenting. I was thinking, actually, like, as I was sitting here and, and uh, enwrapped by what Lori was saying, I was thinking, like, when did we actually meet? And I had to, like, Google real quick, and it was, like, 2011. This was, like, when the personhood amendment was being voted on in Mississippi. That is when we met, and we were, at that point, we're talking about Rennie Gibbs, who had been criminally prosecuted for having a miscarriage, right? So, like, this is a, it, this is a problem that I'm glad to see that the, sort of the mainstream of people who are, like, activated on reproductive issues are like caring about but it's one like we can make no mistake that has already like long been on the radar of reproductive justice advocates because also if you just think about it like plainly incarceration mass incarceration is a reproductive justice issue because when you remove people from their communities they're not they're not able to parent their families the people who are locked up you know they are if they're giving birth they are doing so in shackles and you know being mistreated as they're doing so People are, you know, who are incarcerated are not able to just access the ability to become pregnant, right? So, like, all these things have long been intertwined, and I think that the thing that's changing is, you know, attention to it, the idea that, oh, shit, now we can be criminalized, too. And I feel like the tenor of a lot of conversations that I've had with folks who see themselves as, you know, like, they are feminists and all this is like, oh, shit, like the thing that I care about is like on the chopping block too, as of, you know, as opposed to folks who've been working within the reproductive justice movement, where just walking down the street, like is, is the thing that is subjecting people to danger from the state. So, you know, I think it's, it's a moment for us to be reckoning with that, but also I think a moment for feminist movements to be reckoning with their relationship to legality. Um, I think that, you know, one of the, one of the things that has been like, maybe to our detriment in a lot of ways is is hoping that we could shape structures and laws to serve us and you know i mean like i want to i want to believe in that right like i chose the law as a tool <laughs> you know this is this is the thing that i dedicate my life to and also we're in this moment we're realizing well that you know they're just going to change the rules of the game on us and so we need to be thinking smartly strategically about like what are the ways in which we will be in like you know in compliance with the state and out of compliance with the state and how do we allocate risk so that people who are more likely to face you know actual like bodily harm from the state are insulated from that risk like how can we be smart and triage these things so that we're protecting the folks who are most likely to to see harm from the state, insulating them as much as possible, and having the people who have had the luxury of legality throughout their lives be the ones who step up and assume some of that risk. So um, so I'm going to pause it. Oh, I guess you, you asked about the Repro Legal Defense Fund. So the Repro Legal Defense Fund is a fund that was created to provide material support for people who are experiencing criminalization on the basis of their reproductive outcomes. So that could mean posting bail for somebody that we, you know, we have resources to be able to post bail so that people don't have to be, you know, like passing the hat in the last in the last moment when somebody those minutes and hours and immediate days when somebody's been, uh, you know, seized by the state, those things matter. But also providing support for legal defenses, for med, uh, for expert fees, for all of the ancillary costs of being caught up in the criminal legal system, right? That like. Some people, in order to be at liberty, they have to pay for an ankle monitor, for a GPS that is going to track them at all times. They have to pay for that. And so the, our Repro Legal Defense Fund wants to be able to remove those barriers to people, to keep them in their communities while we're working hard, you know, and we work hard to train attorneys to fight the charges from the state so that people can continue their lives. Because one of the most destructive things is this, you know, pretrial detention, right? So many of the people who are under the control of the state are people who are in pretrial detention. And so that means like they are not, they like, you know, this, this can languish. There have been cases that I've worked on where people, you know, essentially like because they were unable to afford bail, spent years while their case was being adjudicated, like behind bars, right? And this, so the Repro Legal Defense Fund was created to address this. And we hope that it's a resource that nobody ever needs, like, but we also recognize that it like, you know, we've, 
we've got people coming to us, unfortunately, and we anticipate that there will be more in the, in the coming months and years. Thank you. And I want to turn to you, Amir. Um, one of the things, of course, Sister Song has embodied the reproductive justice analysis since its founding, and it's, it's pretty decentralized in certain ways. Um, and so I don't know if you can give one answer for all the, the pieces of Sister Song, um, but my question is really, um, when we have these moments of panic over abortion specifically, um, when we're talking a lot about Roe, um, it's very easy in the sort of big public discourse for the rest of reproductive concerns to fall away, the things that are encapsulated by the reproductive justice framework. And so my question to you is really, how is Sister Song, um, or maybe different parts are doing it differently, but how is Sister Song approaching this moment where it's abortion, 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 and as people on this call have already said, abortion is one part of this picture. Thank you for the question and uh, thanks for having me here. I think the best way to answer it, or at least to begin to answer this question is in lieu of the previous comments in that when we were talking about organizing earlier in this call, there is a variety of ways in which reproductive justice touches every social justice movement in my in my humble appearance uh, opinion. So living wages, the, the fight for 15 is one of those things. The electoral process, for those that are able to and eligible voting and making sure they have a plan to vote and that they have invite their friends to vote, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in my opinion, uh, housing is a human right as is healthcare. And so how we think about the ability for our communities to live and thrive and really enjoy all of the aspects that life has to offer us, whether we're in Atlanta, Georgia, such as myself or if we're somewhere else around the country, if not the world. Um, it's also been proven, I would say, over time that abstinence-only education is not getting it done, you know, and how we think about developing the folks to come after us to understand their sexual health, their sexual bodies, and to actually respect those bodies as they are and as they continue to, to be molded and shaped. All of those aspects of social justice movements touch reproductive justice. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Sister Song was founded in 1996, and they were answering a call a call that I think is very similar to the call that we are in right now, which is how do we take care of ourselves for ourselves, much like the, the FUBU comment. And I think that with any and every tenet of reproductive justice, it comes down to bodily autonomy. Can I live and in, in work in a place where I can thrive? Do I feel safe? Do the people around me feel safe? Um, how do I access all of the, the, the resources that really are my dignified right to have. And so um, I would say and, and love to throw out that let's talk about sex will be an opportunity to talk about those things and engage in those things. We're going to be in Dallas this year, August 25th through the 28th, and I will put the link in the chat. Um, but to directly answer your question, I think it's about how do we pivot? How do we make room for human dignity for all people? And this moment, as is true of other moments, have required connections and building intersectionality in a way that it really does have value. Um, so he, in, in, in our bases of Atlanta, Georgia, there's quite a bit of work, be that birth justice work, be that culture change shift work, be that um, general advocacy that we are doing to help keep, keep in mind that how we think about Roe and where it's going to go and how it's going to shift means that all of us need to be connected and that all of us need to be working together to achieve that dignity and liberation that I personally believe we can get and that we should have every right to have access to in our lifetime. Thank you so much. Um, and I wanna turn now to Anne and we're starting to get questions in from the chat, which are fantastic. Um, and um, so one of the uh, disputes sort of between the more maybe mainstream um, pro-choice movement and other activists has been a question of tactics. And I'm thinking back to um, when Trump had just been elected and uh, anti-choice activists decided to do a day of action um, and they were protesting outside every clinic they could find and generally being horrible. 
And uh, here in New York, they were outside the Planned Parenthood clinic in Soho. Um, and activists wanted to defend the clinics. Um, and Planned Parenthood said, no, don't defend the clinics. We'll do a nice rally in like Union Square or wherever, somewhere away from the clinic. We don't want to make noise. We don't want to politicize healthcare. We don't want to, you know, create tumult um, where patients might be coming in. And activists said basically no. Like we are also patients. No one gets to tell us, you know, this is not our place too. And we're going to go defend the clinics and show people going in that they have allies um, and not just enemies. And I thought that was such an interesting moment. And my understanding has been that NYC for abortion rights somewhat emerged from that moment. Um, and your tactics have been to engage in very direct, including physical confrontation with a bunch of anti-choice activists who go and harass people going to get healthcare um, at that Soho clinic. Um, and so I wanted to ask you what tactics you have been using and developing um, and what you found effective. Yeah, thanks for the question, Sarah. Um, yeah, we, NYC for Abortion Rights, got started um, five years ago in response to those calls to defund Planned Parenthood. Um, and we very consciously made the decision to defy Planned Parenthood's wishes for us not to counter protest uh, those anti abortion activists uh, and to show up and defend the clinic. Um, and it was a pretty controversial move by a lot of people in the mainstream repro rights world. Um, but we really felt that antis should not be able to take over space in front of our abortion clinics and harass and intimidate patients, and that it was really important for us to confront those activists. Um, not only because of the harm that they're doing to patients outside of clinics, but also just because they're politicizing that space outside of abortion clinics and using that space to grow their movement, uh, which includes, you know, elements of the white supremacist movement, the Christian nationalist movement, uh, anti-queer, uh, you know, very bigoted movements. Th these movements are all connected to each other. Uh, and by not confronting these anti-abortion activists, we're just kind of giving up that space and sort of allowing these groups to uh, to kind of control the narrative outside of our clinics and to to grow their own uh, hateful movements. Um, so we made the choice to confront them, and that has been our mission for the last five years. Um, and our 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 tactics basically include confronting a couple of different anti-abortion groups. Um, outside of their churches, and then trying to physically prevent them from getting to the Planned Parenthood clinic. Um, so it's a very confrontational strategy. Um, we uh, have to deal with a lot of uh, police presence. Um, the police are always on the anti-abortion uh, activist side. They, the police never support us. They do not protect us. The police don't keep us safe in, in any context. Um, so our movement has, um, you know, has always been about uh, police abolition and prison abolition, along with supporting uh, abortion access. Um, and I think part of what has allowed our our uh, small band of activists to grow uh, is that we've been very vocal um, about how prison and police abolition are so connected and so important to reproductive justice. Um, and that plays out in our kind of anti-police uh, rhetoric and uh, confronting police and trying to keep police from uh, interfering with patient care outside of clinics as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very confrontational set of strategies and set of tactics, um, but there's a really long history of clinic defense that we're drawing on. Um, when Operation Rescue, a very militant anti-abortion group, uh, was very active in the late 80s through the mid 90s, um, they were able to shut down some abortion clinics with their numbers and with their intimidation tactics. And a lot of uh, radical um, pro-abortion supporters uh, defended clinics successfully, especially in Buffalo, um, and were able to protect patients and protect clinics uh, and confront anti-abortion supporters. So there's a long history of clinic defense, and I think the, the tactic is one that we're going to need to uh, you know, kind of um, fully support now in this moment. Um, at a recent um, clinic defense that we did a couple of months ago, um, we saw members of uh, uh, 
white nationalist groups turn out to support these religious anti-abortion processions. Um, so they're very clear about the, you know, the alliances that they're forming. So it's it's really obvious that confronting anti-abortion activists um, is really going to be an important part of the strategy going forward. We're we're very concerned as well that, you know, kind of as uh, as bans spread across the South and the Midwest. Um, that a lot of activists, a lot of anti-abortion supporters um, are, you know, they're always going to be targeting clinics in, in those areas in the South and, and the Midwest. Their, you know, anti-abortion presence is huge there. Um, but we're also really concerned that, um, you know, that they're going to turn their gaze onto clinics in blue states, you know, onto clinics where, uh, in states where abortion is protected. Um, as another tactic in their toolkit to uh, keep people from accessing abortion care um, and, and intimidating patients. Um, so we really need to be prepared, I think, for an influx of uh, anti-abortion supporters coming to states where abortion is currently protected. Um, and I hope that we can, I, I think we've seen a huge uh, amount of support for these more confrontational tactics. Um, and I hope that we're going to be able to see more support for confronting anti-abortion supporters and white Christian nationalists from more of the mainstream reproductive rights groups as well. Thanks, Anne. And I want to turn to the questions we're getting in from the chat. We're getting a lot of really good questions, and so I don't want to delay getting to them. Um, and I'd like to start, I believe um, our publisher is putting some of Lux's work on reproductive justice in the chat. We're going to continue trying to drop articles in there that are useful and relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, we got a few questions about internationalism, basically. So asking, do you have international relationships in your work? Do you look to international examples? Um, and I think that might also feed into a question, which is we've, multiple people have talked about, you know, evading the state effectively. And so if we're talking about, you know, folks in Los Libres helping Americans have abortions outside of what's legal here, you know, is that one avenue that we should talk about today? So international relationships and examples, and maybe also how that relates to the, to the legal climate here. Um, is there someone who is burning to start? Rocky? Yeah, so that's a lot and want to thank folks for those questions. Um, a lot of reporters and, and folks ask us about um, Mexico in particular because our region is, you know, uh, South Texas and, um, you know, I grew up with the border like 20 minutes from where I live. Um, and I like to, you know, preface questions about like collab, like international collaborations. Um, with, um, I think something that we need to talk about a little bit more, especially if like, you know, folks are asking these questions, like, um, I think it's really important that we destigmatize the idea of traveling in particular to Mexico for healthcare. If you're from the Rio Grande Valley, South Texas, um, going to Mexico for healthcare is what you do. I didn't see an American doctor until I was in my mid to late twenties, at least. Um, you grow up going to the dentist and to the doctor in Mexico. You go, you have lunch there on Sunday, and that's where your dentist and your doctor are. And they're accessible and they're cheap, and you can just walk right in, and then the prescriptions are right next door, and they're, you know, a tenth of the cost what they are on the other side. And that's what we do because we don't have access to proper health care. So for folks from, from areas like the Rio Grande Valley, that's a normal thing. Going to Mexico for health care is not just a tradition it is part of the the you know it's yeah. not a it's not a border it's a, I mean yes it's a border but it's a it's a permeable line that has a blended culture and we we uh, cross and live you know across it you know in in lots of different ways right and so um when people are asking about these international relations and trying to sort of um you know we've had reporters sort of like almost like one want, want to like scandalize the idea of, oh, you know, things are so bad in the United States that Americans have to go to Mexico. I'm like, A, Mexico is awesome. 
And B, like we've been doing that for a long, long time. That's how we grew up and that's how our parents grew up. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a legacy in terms of our relation, our, our, our binational relationship. It already exists. Um, and where people are talking about traveling to Mexico or helping people get to Mexico for abortions, we're not talking about the multi-billion dollar industry where people who have the wealth who are looking for cheaper fertility treatments go and set up at a resort on the beach in Mexico to get the discounted price of fertility costs. IVF and hormones and all of those treatments are literally like a quarter of the cost of what it is here in the United States. You have um, there, there are there are resorts in Florida and in other like like on the on the west coast and the east coast on on the beaches where rich Europeans will uh, come and do fertility treatments and birth in the United States in order to have children who have naturalized citizenship. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about the droves of people who are going to Mexico all of the time um, for their health care. And so, making this you know scandalizing the idea of folks going to abortion for Mexico is problematic on a lot of layers. We've been doing it and folks from other countries doing it all the time. You know, the United States hosts rich Europeans to come here and get their health care and their citizenship, which I think is way more scandalous given the state um, of, you know, immigration issues in, in this country. Um, and, you know, yeah, like, I will do whatever I need to do within the legal compliance limits through, you know, our organization to help people get their abortions no matter what. And personally, I will do whatever it takes and I will go, you know, wherever I need to go to help someone get an abortion. I was just in Mexico a couple of weeks ago and they have their COVID shit on point. It was way safer there. Everybody in the streets is still wearing masks. There are uh, 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 agents from the health department in the streets sanitizing people's hands that are just walking by. Everything is very clean. Like they kind of have it on lock. Going to Mexico is not some scary thing. Like shit is nice over there and it even feels a bit safer. And when I got, I got a UTI, which sorry if that's TMI, but I got that in when I was in Mexico and I was able to sit at a doctor's office for a little less than five minutes, see the doctor for free, and then go right next door and get the antibiotics that I needed for about five bucks. Um, and yes, I have insurance, I can do that here, but you know, I think that question is like, yeah, we're gonna do everything that we can within our legal bounds as organizations, but those of us, you know, Lori and Farah and, you know, our, our drove and our network of folks who are committed to um, abortion and reproductive justice, we're not just counting on our 501c3s. Like, nonprofit is an industry like any other, and it's not gonna save us. Like, I, we are, like, our, our 501c3 is a way for us to get money um, and to pay us. Like, just. We ain't never counted on that. Yeah, we are not counting on that. And so, you know, yeah, we have a network of folks. And like I said, there are people willing to put their bodies on, on the line. And, you know, like if rich Europeans and rich Americans can travel to other countries to do fertility treatments and get cancer treatments even, right? Like there's all of this, uh, tra there's all of this, like healthcare travel is not a new thing. Um, it's just that people are like scandalizing it because abortion is already a stigmatized issue. So we're going to do everything that we can to help people get wherever the fuck they need to get to get their abortions in whatever way possible, all within the legal compliance bound through our 501c3s. But we are, we are a, we are a swarm um, of people who are willing to do what it takes outside the 501. Yeah. And I wonder, I mean, yeah, go ahead, Lori. Can I also say, we've already been doing organizing outside of outside of america aid access is outside of the u.s and it's the primary thing that people keep promoting for access to pills right um a lot of the tactics that people are using first of all let's just get it out the way that the protocol for mesoprostol comes from brazil brazilian women figured out how to use mesoprostol for abortions we wouldn't even have it if not for the people of brazil so let's just put that out there first. And then secondly, a lot of the, the organizing tactics that we're using in the US, Global South, yes. Global South gave us all this stuff, right? If not for the people of Brazil, 
we wouldn't even have like in, in, in the rest of the global south. And I've been in conversation with folks all over the global south for years, like for over the last decade, people in Nigeria, people in Senegal, people in right people in and people outside of the global south, people in Europe, in Poland, people in Ireland before they repealed the eighth. Right. It's one of the reasons that in in interviews, I keep telling people, I don't know how the U.S. or these Republican lawmakers in red states have the caucasity to sit up here and be like, we're about to ban pills from coming into our states. And I'm like, from China, from India, y'all think you're going to go over to the Netherlands and see your sucker suits and impress them and get your hands on Rebecca Gomertz? Sure. Okay, Gomer Pyle, you do that. Like, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Nobody's, they can't stop fentanyl from coming in the country. They're not going to stop no daggum abortion pills. And furthermore, if Ireland couldn't stop pills, and they're a whole island, who that could fit in Texas, right? Ireland is smaller than the state of Texas. What the U.S. going to do? Like, they can't, a state can't take your mail without going to the postmaster in your community with a warrant. So, I mean, I don't know what federal laws they think they're about to pass to seize up all your abortion pill mail, right? I mean, like, I, I don't, I think they overestimate the amount of willpower that the American people have to police this, right? You think that the people, the white folks who are dying from fentanyl overdoses are gonna be happy that you're not working on fentanyl, you, you just find the DEA to go round up abortion pills? Hell no. And some of those abortion pills won't even be for abortion because people buy mesoprostol um, off the black market for ulcers, for arthritis, for their dogs, for their cats to save money. Like, let's not play games here. Ain't nobody fist to get rid of mesoprostol. Cytotec ain't going to be off the market because Pfizer would never. And so, like, let's let go of all of these illusions that people have about what's going to happen with pills. They're going nowhere. And they're not going to scare Gen Z or Gen A out of taking pills. These kids have been taking pills their whole lives. That's not going to happen. They can to let it go. Tag on to that. Like, I mean, I think this is, this is what I'm getting at when I'm talking about we need to reconsider our relationship to legality. Because, like, this is exactly the lesson that we learned from organizing that's, that's happening, you know, across Latin America, on the African continent, right? Like, in all these different places where officially abortion is banned, but practically it is legal through feminist networks who are providing, and they're not doing it under the auspices of like, you know, uh, equivalent to a 501c3, right? Like these are collectives that are doing this work that have been doing this work for a long time. I think we have a lot of lessons to learn from them and the ways in which they navigate spaces. I think that like, it's, it's kind of a silly assumption that the state is going to try to ban abortion and then abortions aren't going to happen like that was never that was never the case that wasn't the case before Roe. that hasn't been the case on any place on the planet where the law has sought to ban abortion i think you know it, it just means that we're gonna have to rethink whether or not we're coloring within the lines and like that's I think one of the lessons to learn from what has happened with sb8 in texas is you know the idea that it's like now there is a chill people can get sued and so people aren't like providing the care. I think that what that means then is that people who are in these informal spaces who don't have that same relationship to the state as like a licensed healthcare provider or something like that are the ones who stand in to fill the gap. And so what that means from the lawyering perspective is that we need to make sure that folks are safe when they're doing it, safe from the punishment by the state. Because, you know, exactly like Lori said, there's no way abortion is too big to fail. And, you know, the idea of abortion pills coming to the country, there is no practical way that the state can enforce that across the board. So what it means is concentrated enforcement on people who are already easily within the grasp of the state. So that's, you know, like people who are undocumented, people who are already under state control. And so we want to be very careful that in, of, of insulating, I'm going to keep coming back to this, insulating people from harm from the state um, because I think that's, you know, what we see, especially like right now, what we see is desperation is this like, we're going to, you know, we're going to ban everything and it's going to be a million years for giving people a pill and, and, you know, whatever, just throw the book at people. But that the practical reality is that it's like the, the punishment is really just going to fall on like a narrow subset of folks. And so we want to keep laser focused on keeping those folks safe from harm while we know that people are 
organizing in communities everywhere now already they have been it's you know like this is again not not new this is not a new conversation at all uh, are organizing to deploy care to people in like you know and in the ways that they did you know before during and after row whatever like, whatever we want to call can, that can i piggyback on that super super quick is that when people ask about what can you do to fight criminalization that in order to fight criminalization of abortion we have to address criminalization of pregnancy outcomes full stop because the way that they could they don't need new laws to criminalize abortion they already have weaponized fetal homicide laws and child abuse laws in ways to criminalize people while they're pregnant for their pregnancy outcomes they don't need a new law to make abortion criminal to be able to criminalize you for self-managing your abortion. If you want to find out if that's true, ask Bebe Shui or ask, you know what I'm saying, ask Pervy Patel. If you can end up in court, you don't have to go to prison to be criminalized. Let me just say that, first of all, because the criminalization process is the point, right? It's the point, it's the point is to put fear into people, right? They don't have to have a successful case to do that. And if you want some more, I mean, I can tell you all about Latisse's case from, from Latisse Fisher's case from beginning to end, because I helped with the case from beginning to end. I just spoke to her last week, right? She is still, still impacted from that two and a half months she spent, spent in jail for a prosecution that never happened. But forever, when people Google her name, it will say that she was prosecuted, that she was brought up on charges of second degree murder forever. Lizette's picture will always come up when people Google her with a mugshot that she was prosecuted. Like that harm cannot be undone. So in order to undo that, we have to talk about the people who are being prosecuted for, um, for, for using drugs during pregnancy, who are prosecuted for having stillbirth, the people who are prosecuted for having home birth. Whether you feel home birth is icky and you don't like it and it's irresponsible and woo woo woo, y'all literally, I'm telling you, because liberals are the ones that have I have the most problems with this. Get over it, move on. Because if we don't defend them, they get to come for us too. Like it, it can't be disconnected. Abortion can't be disconnected from the the um, the prosecution of people who are drug users, and it can't be the, disconnected from other birth justice. None of it. Um, oh, Joe, ooh, yeah, um, <laughs> someone just asked a question in the chat about the direct actions against crisis pregnancy centers by the Network Drainage Revenge. Do y'all want me to answer that real quick? Because I can. Go for it. <laughs> okay, so I honestly will shed no tears about a crisis pregnancy center getting spray painted, right? Um, like, I'm not going to lose any sleep about it. Do I think it's necessarily the best strategy? Probably not. Um, because all the right is going to do is go see, see, because all they ever do with anything that is seen to be violent on our side, or, um, especially if it's not well planned out, or it's like, an, or not even well planned out, especially if it's not an uprising right, that we can like justify in the time. Um, it's gonna be, it's gonna be used to justify their own violence, even though they've been killing people for the last 30 years, right? And all that someone did is spray paint. <laughs> it's still gonna be, we get to be the hypocrites, right? Because we're, we're progressives and we don't do that stuff. Like that's always been the brand of progressives, right? It's like when I say I'm a progressive gun owner, like, I mean, but I don't get to tell other people how to do their activism either, right? So even though it wouldn't be my strategy, that don't mean it ain't gotta be the strategy. I personally say we should protest CPCs. I mean, I don't see the problem in it. The same way they get to pray outside of our clinics, I don't see the problem with handing out accurate health information outside of CPCs that they, they, people are preying on people, especially if, and I wanna add this really important caveat, you have set up a pregnancy and parenting resource center that is all options based 
in your community that people can be directed to as an option instead of a CPC. Don't go protesting those damn CPCs and you ain't got nothing else for people. Because guess what people gonna tell you? Fuck you, get out of my business. I need these diapers today. Fuck you, get out of my business. I need this crib. I don't like these damn people either, but I need these resources. Because that's what I'd have told your ass when I went in that CPC to get that pack of diapers. And I did not want to pray with them people, but I needed that pack of diapers. So I'm just throwing it out there that like, there's a reason why YHF is in the process of launching a pregnancy and parenting resource center. There's a reason why MRFF already has one. And it's because we already knew that this beefing up of CPCs by states was happening. Hell, Texas has been doing it for the last seven years. We knew this was coming and that the harm that was gonna be done was coming, right? And the harm they've already done historically. And you have to have an alternative. People need those resources and they know it. I wanna, um, I know Rocky wanted to comment on that too. And then I'm gonna introduce uh, another one of these questions. Uh, well, we can do that because I can talk about all the things forever. So, I mean, we could, we could, we could move forward. That's, that's fine with me. Okay, um, I'll, I'll add in one of the questions that's coming in. Um, and if you wanna address both, also fine. Okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, Fair, I wanted to mention the All Options PRC in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, and also we got a question in about um, what medical students can do and what folks can do. I think we got a question specifically from Texas um, and everyone wanted to mention Medical Students for Choice, which is an incredible organization. And that's one org you can look to to figure out what you can do as a medical student and also um, someone added in here, um, obviously trained to be able to do abortions. Um, I wanted to throw in one really straightforward question here, which is uh, how can labor best support the abortion movement today? Yeah, I, I love that question. Um, it is, um, you know, just referring back to something Amir said, like, Labor justice issues are reproductive justice issues, right? Um, I think one of the big asks um, that 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 we have, at, you know, and I say we in terms of like, you know, my organization and like, you know, the organizations that we're in like coalition and partnership with, is, um, you know, asking our cross movement partners to get loud about abortion, to um, shy back from being afraid to you know, affect their membership or to alienate people, um, whatever language they use, you know, um, teaching, um, you know, labor, you know, membership bases, um, staff, uh, you know, union folks, um, the basic principles of, of the intersectionality of reproductive justice and labor and like doing that, you know, that, you know, popular education model, like, hey, let's talk about how does abortion in particular and reproductive justice actually tie into our work? Because actually, if that political education is done and it's brought to the table at, in particular, the labor movement, that is, um, that's potentially like a, a strengthening of, of communications. It's a strengthening of arguments for unionizing. You know, there's a lot in there that actually really could support and lift up, you know, folks doing labor justice work. And so, you know, positioning abortion access, positioning reproductive justice as a labor issue, um, I think is a really important thing and making that really, really visible. Um, you know, folks are, are have always kind of been willing to, you know, join a campaign here or there, or like maybe share a donation link or something like that. Um, but, you know, we're asking cross movement partners to incorporate the use of the word abortion um, into your language um, and to be loud and explicit um, about um, how your, you know, fill in the blank justice work is reprodu reproductive justice work, right? Like, just like Amir was saying, the fight for 15, you know, like that there's, there's, it's very clear to, to folks in reproductive justice movement that uh, that is a labor justice issue. Um, and I think this moment in particular as a sort of unprecedented moment of, um, I keep telling people like, 
especially in the Rio Grande Valley, like after what happened to the woman in South Texas who was um, arrested and charged with murder, um, you know, we really saw community in a very conservative and religious, you know, state um, be way more compassionate um, than we have ever seen local media co covering us way more compassionately than they ever have. Um, and so these are issues that touch people's lives. And when you're, you know, trying to talk to people about, you know, what it means to fight for a fair wage, a living wage, a thriving wage, even, you know, this is now something that I think that's visible enough and um, can like the way that, you know, abortion issues are being like spotlighted in the media like there's enough compassion and sympathy out there for people to 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 look at that message and say oh yeah you know that that makes sense um and then that goes for you know all of the all of the all of the movements right you know we need in in biros to talk about you know those communities that are living you know outside or downwind from the coal plants those those pipelines those indigenous communities that are having their sacred sites destroyed those are reproductive justice issues um and if you take on reproductive justice right now the moment is really talking about you know um what i would say is defending the sacred and that's abortion so like if you can incorporate that into your language if you can do political education with your folks that's going to help us all like we don't need droves of volunteers you know emailing us and knocking down our doors we don't actually have the capacity for that because every in texas every two years we just get hundreds of like hey how can i help i'll do anything for you and like actually that's a lot of work for us that we just literally like we would have to hire five people to deal with the people who want to volunteer for us and then there's the vetting and the safety issues and all of that stuff right so um we need folks to go back to to in their movements build that reproductive justice in um and then you know once that work is being done then then you can hit us up and be like hey you know we're trying to do this are we on the right track and then we can and then we can really do some cross-movement collaboration um, and I just wanted to say towards the um, question about solidarity and, and that kind of activism, like, you know, I think that in, in particular young activists who are um, raging and who are upset and who want to do something because they're just, you know, kind of righteously angry, right? Like there has to be some kind of outlet for that righteousness. Um, and if petty vandalism is the outlet, whatever, you go do the wheat paste and, and the thing, you know, like, I, I feel like it goes in phases, right? Like, that's what I was doing when I was in my late teens, early 20s, you know, and, 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 and it's needed because it visibilizes and it gives, um, it gives, I think, a, a, a powerful sense of like civil disobedience. Like, I think that our youth should be encouraged to be civilly disobedient in whatever way is possible and safe for them. Um, because what that does is it sows the seed for like the desire to learn more and to be on the liberatory path. It sows the seed and the desire. Um, and so when you are in um, that space of like um, young righteous anger and you want to do something with it, like, you know, as long as you're not hurting our people, um, and making claims um, in our names, in the names of our organizations or of our people or particular individuals who have been spotlighted in the media, then you do you. Um, and I think that, you know, there is something to be said for a, a, a sort of next step, more coordinated, supported and organized set of direct actions. And direct action is actually a thing with a process that one can be trained to do. It's not just going out and fucking shit up. You know that's not a uh, direct action or direct action is a is a is a thing there's models there's ways that include safety making sure that you know we're having the right voices be at the right time in the leadership and, and all of those things and so you know it's a, it's the beginning of, of a scale and um solidarity really means um i think by by default it's like not acting alone right um if you are an, an individual actor doing your own thing that is one thing but solidarity is you know about locked arms right you're standing side by side with people so um it's one thing to be expressing that um that need and to be you know performing some civil disobedience or just being civilly disobedient i mean say performing um but you know being in solidarity requires a little bit more work being in solidarity requires some education 
it requires some checks and balances and it requires, you know, following the leadership of people who have been doing the work and in particular, the queer trans and people of color and especially black folks who have been leading the work because that's really, you know, the heart of reproductive justice. And so in order to be in solidarity um, with us, you know, that that does need to take place. The basic diversity of tactics approach of this call, I feel like is very strong. Um, and I wanna turn to Anne um, and then Lori and, um, then if anyone else wants to address these questions, and then we are 11 minutes from the end of this call, unfortunately. Um, so I also want to give people a sort of last round to speak to some of the things I think are most important that people are doing right now. And even, you know, if you want to talk for a minute about what your organization is doing right this second and how people can support it, um, if that's what, what you want to address, that would also be great. So I'm going to go and Lori, and then we'll kind of do a round. Yeah, I 100% agree with you, Rocky, that, um, you know, uh, we we really need coordinated direct action now more than ever, and that there are so many different ways to stand in solidarity with all the people who are outraged by what's going on and to support the work that's been that's been ongoing. Um, I, I guess I kind of feel that, like, anybody who's interested in doing confrontational tactics, uh, you know, are, that's that's one one fork of this movement that's definitely needed. It's not the only thing, um, but it is definitely, uh, I think, uh, an important part of how we need to respond right now. And it makes sense that people are mad. Like, we, we're all mad. We, we should all be so mad right now that we should have millions of people out in the streets, you know, uh, demanding um, access to abortion, demanding uh, more resources for pregnant people. Um, and I think, you know, the, if those people who are uh, vandalizing clinics, you know, that that type of vandalism is just, that is just not violence. <laughs> that, you know, the, the true violence is what's being visited on people, especially low income and people of color every single day as they try to access reproductive health care. So I, you know, it's like, I think all of us are in agreement that we would never, you know, kind of equate the violence, uh, suppose the quote unquote violence being done to these crisis pregnancy centers with like the true violence against people. Um, and I just, I think that a lot of the progressive media is just not good, <laughs> not good at messaging that in any way. Um, and I, I hope that all these people who are outraged and who are, uh, you know, kind of willing to, you know, take the risk to vandalize CPCs are also going to be willing to go out into the streets, um, you know, not just one time when the decision is handed down, the Dobbs decision, whenever that happens, but over and over and over and over again, um, and kind of join these movements in, in a long-term way. You know, we just can't have people kind of showing up one day, uh, you know, kind of donating to one fund one time. Time. Like that's just that's not going to cut it. Like we really are going to need people to invest in long-term strategies um, to be involved in civil disobedience and direct action long-term. You know, to to support abortion funds in a long-term way. Uh, you know, to to make monthly donations to set up your own coalitions. Um, I mean, I think the 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 coalition of coalitions I think is probably you know a pretty you know, kind of key part of this since reproductive justice is so connected to every other social justice movement. Um, how do we make sure that we're all coordinating with each other? Um, like, how do we make sure that everybody's kind of turning out in, in one big unified mass, you know, t when this decision comes down and, you know, and continuing? Um, so I think uh, that all the coalition building, you know, that has been going on for decades is now, I think, gonna uh, we're going to see the impact of that. Laurie, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I don't disagree. And when I was saying violence, I definitely don't mean real violence. I think it's interpreted in a, what we all absolutely know is not genuine. Um, you know, it's not, <clears throat> it's not, it's, it's played for clicks and political gain. We know it's not an actual, real substantive um what's the word I'm, i have covid long covid so like my brain is still foggy but we know they're not coming to it with real intentions right like they're not coming with with um true intentions so um i just know that like it's just not a real thing that that conservatives are actually concerned about it's kind of like the whole george floyd uprising 
concerns. Oh my goodness, they brought, they burned down the target, the violence, the violence, all the, there was no dead people. Like, what are you talking about? It was a target. Ooh, not a target. Even target didn't care about their target. Like, stop, stop it. Um, so like, I, you know, I don't care if you go vandalize a CPC. I'm just saying, as what Rocky was saying much more eloquently than I did at this end of this day, that like there's another there's another step. Once you're done with like whatever, spitballing, egging, and toilet papering actually works better than egging alone. Um, just whatever you're doing, once y'all done with, uh, it's true, Amir. <laughs> It's, it's, it's true it's true facts um wouldn't know why i know that i'm just saying i heard it once you're done with those things like we got other things that you can do that are you know much more um intricate and um and, and evolve involved i'm trying to say involved not involved um the other thing i wanted to say about unions is that they can fight for abortion coverage in their workers health care coverage there has been so much chipping away at healthcare, um, abortion and healthcare co coverage that there are state exchanges. Uh, most of the red state state exchanges can't even cover abortion care. And a lot of um, companies have just said, eh, because I mean, let's be honest, anybody that they cover that has a vagina, they want to save money on. So it's like birth coverage, no. Abortion coverage, no. I mean, like this, it's been this ongoing fight around anything that's considered women's health. So um, we need to fight to get abortion coverage back into healthcare plans. So yeah, that's, yes, absolutely. Abortion for comrades, heart. And also like Rocky's talking about, you know, us showing up strategically for each other. There's more for people to show up for than rallies. You know, like when we have someone criminalized, what labor can do to help us is show up when people are criminalized. I feel like that's gonna be one of the biggest um, fronts that we're gonna need people. Like one of the the, the good threats that I can imply, in, that I can utilize against DAs is that if you go with this prosecution, I will make this person the face of your next campaign. I will make their mugshot the face of your next campaign. And we will fill every hearing with people in free insert person's name, t-shirts, every single day we will be on the courthouse steps right behind you every time you get behind a mic we will make your life miserable every day not just from outside the state don't think that this is some color changes coming in no 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 we people here in mississippi alabama texas right the people who live here we gonna show up and we gonna make you miserable Perfect. Um, and we have three minutes left before actually we lose our accessible closed captioning. So I'm going to do a lightning round. Um, and there's so much we've talked about today. I will throw into the union thing. We ran a piece by Amy Littlefield on clinic workers unionizing in Texas who got shut down by Planned Parenthood. Um, and we did a lot of reporting on that. And that we'll drop that link in the chat. But um, unions in and out of the movement. Um, so I want to go around real quick so everyone can have their final word and that can be what you think people should be doing to get involved right now or the most important thing people should have in mind. Um, we're going to share links to all the organizations in the chat, but this is your lightning round last word. Everyone one minute so we don't go over time. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And I don't know, Lori, do you want to add on to what you just said or did that did that catch your? I'll be super quick. As a disabled person, I just want to tell everybody that you have a place in this movement, regardless of your ability, regardless of your age, regardless of who you love or what your gender your presentation is, like there's a space for you and just get in where you fit in and, and keep it moving, like there's somewhere for you to be, whether it's just tweeting, whatever. I can find you a place. If you can't find your place, you email me and I'll find you a place. Amir? Real fast, um, thanks for having me. And on the subject of labor, I just wanted to say two things. There is dignity in all work. And part of the 
conversation could very well be about talking about what sufficient childcare looks like and having a pay that reflects the value of taking care of families that are already here. And I think sometimes we miss the ability to let folks see that you can live and thrive and have access to all the things you need in that context of labor that it's possible. Um, and all forms of healthcare, I think, should be covered by plans in general. Um, it's not just about, well, I'll, I'll, sh I'll shut up for the purpose of time, uh, but thank you for having me. Sarah? Yeah, so I guess in the vein of like the, the there's a place for everybody and all of that, I, I think I wanna talk to the to the folks right now who are like, I'm gonna start a thing. Like maybe there's some kind of a way to like get people money to have their abortions or whatever. If you're having an idea right now, it's possible it already exists. Find the people doing that work, give them your time, give them your money. That's what you'd like. I saw a question before that was like, what can we do for abortions for people and trigger bans? There are people doing that work in those states with those trigger bans, give them your money. And then the other thing I have to say, Repro Legal Helpline, you got questions about criminalization, just keep that handy, reprolegalhelpline.org to get in touch with an attorney, send people there, it's a resource. Anne? Yeah, I would love to encourage people to start their own uh, clinic defense organizations in their cities. Uh, the anti-abortion movement is strong, they're organized, um, they exist everywhere, and we should be confronting them everywhere. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, you can go to NYC for Abortion Rights, and we have some resources on, uh, you know, kind of uh, tactics and strategies for confronting uh, the anti-abortion presence um, outside of clinics, but not just outside of clinics. If there's a right to life rally or march, we should be protesting them. Um, so uh, that's that's one way to get involved. Rocky? Um, yes, I have a list and I'll try to be quick. So um, for trying to get um, involved, if you are new, just echoing Vera, like there are people doing the things, check with them. Um, if you are going to do clinic defense, try and contact the clinic and see if they're cool with that. And if you know, they, they, they want you there because that can be a thing. Um, don't start auntie networks. Don't start a group of people who have a bedroom in their house that an abortion haver can go recuperate in that don't refer to those networks as underground railroads. All of that is garbage on fire yeah. garbage can. Please do not do that. We have networks. We have, we literally have an enormous network of people who are doing this work and who have the resources to do it. So just please, for the love of everything, don't just don't do that like at all, please. Um, it makes things difficult for us. It really yeah. does. It causes more work and um, it's it's just a lot for us to deal with. Um, and yeah. um, I want to say also that like it's really important for folks who are new to abortion um, advocacy, but also like folks who've been in it for a while to look um, to the Global South for leadership. Like Vera yeah. mentioned, um, in the Global South, they are doing the thing, honey, like they are doing it and they are not using 501s to do it. They are using, you know, decolonized community based methods um to get their people what they need um and that is the you know that is that is that is where we will find the leadership we need in the global south um you know we you know policy work is important and good and legal work is important and good and 501c3 work is important and good but those none of those things are the path to liberation so until we have like you know land back and reparations we're not counting on any of those methods to be you know, um, liberatory for us. Um, and I want to encourage folks to look also at, um, I got to spend some time in a Zapatista community a couple of years ago that was um, like a global women's gathering. And I actually got to speak um, yeah. with women from across um, the world who um, came to this encuentro. Um, and the EZLN, the, um, I'm not going to try and say it in Spanish, but the EZLN women, um, the Mujeres Zapatistas, they have 10 um, principal laws um, that they live by. Um, and number three of that law, which was, I want to say, established in like 1998 or nine, maybe even, um, is that, um, you know, they use the language of women, but, you know, the, the, the number three law states that, you know, women have the right um, to decide how many children they can and want to have and are able to take care of. 
um, you know, and and it's just it's it's eloquent and it's simple. Um, but again, it leads back to that like we're not going to find you know liberation through the courts, through our 501s, you know, um, through these you know, through these things. We really need to look towards getting out of our imperialist colonized heads about it um, and try things um, from a different direction. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everybody today. It was incredible to hear everybody in conversation and learn from your expertise um, and experience. Um, we will be posting this video online for folks who want to share it with other people who are doing this work or interested in this work. Um, and the goal of the magazine in both trying to pull together some events like this one and in what we publish is to try to um, communicate these strategies out to our readers um, and be sort of doing the work of reflecting back to our readers what's happening in the movement so that the magazine is useful to what is happening on the ground and is also a space where people can think about it. Um, and so we are um, very, very happy to be here with all of you. We thank you. We know you are busier than busy could possibly be. Um, and we look forward to seeing you out there. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>